Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, today we're going to be covering another chapter from business management and IB. This time it is chapter 1.6, Growth and Evolution. Um, we're just going to get right into it. This is a bit of a thick chapter. Um, I'm going to do my best to get through everything, be as comprehensive as possible, but also not, you know, just go on and on and on. And I'll try to keep things simple. Um, the, but yeah, this chapter, it has a lot of content, but none of it is anything too advanced. I mean, rarely is there something in IB. Uh, business management, at least, that's really going to, you know, make you confused. It's all, I think, quite straightforward. Anyway, so getting right into it. Um, so the first thing that we deal with is the scale of opportunities or the scale of a business. So what does this deal with? It deals with basically the idea of what is the maximum output that a business can have. Now, this is not to be confused with the actual production of a business, nor is increasing production, meaning you're getting your scale of opportunities. Scale of opportunities is what could this, this company produce under the potential circumstances. That's given the resources it has available to it. This is just the ideal, the maximum that, I could, that it could create is the scale of opportunities. Um, and the way to increase this is to increase all of the inputs in the business. The inputs, as we'll remember, are the resources that are coming in. So we're talking natural resources, capital, things like that. Um, that's the only way to increase this. Just increasing your production doesn't increase this number because this number is not dependent on how much you're producing. It's depend on it's dependent on how much your resources are because it's the potential. It's not what you're doing. It's the potential. If you are getting to the scale of, of opportunities, then it means that you're maximizing your output uh, based on the resources you have. There's also um, the increased... Um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, increasing of the scale of opportunities means you can reach economies of scale. And we're going to get to that in just one second. But yeah, so increasing this means you're, you're getting new economies of scale. Now, you guys might ask, what are economies of scale? Fantastic question. Economies of scale means, um, basically, it is the idea of reducing your costs or reducing your overall unit costs, which we'll get to that in a sec, but overall reducing unit costs by increasing production. That's to say, if you want to talk about what is a cost per unit, right? What's a cost per unit? Well, if we're producing a product, right? Let's say we're producing hamburgers. <clears throat> There's a certain cost that goes into each hamburger, right? Every hamburger, and then you sell it for a cost that for a price that's normally higher than that. Let's say it costs you five bucks to make a hamburger. You sell it for six and you're making a dollar off of that hamburger. Fantastic. But what happens? Well, what goes into this cost per unit, right? There are two things. There are total variable costs and total fixed costs. And then you divide this by unit cost. That This is like a, an official formula in the little uh, business management booklet. At least I think it's in the booklet, but it is, it's an important formula to know, which is total variable cost plus total fixed cost divided by units produced. This sounds very complicated, but it's quite simple. Total variable costs, that is when I'm making each individual hamburger, how much is it costing me, right? So let's say I'm making a hamburger. What is like the physical things that I need to make this individual hamburger that I'm making. This is not to be confused with the fixed cost. The fixed costs are the things you gotta pay no matter what. Whether you're making one hamburger or you're making a hundred hamburgers, you're paying the same fixed cost because they're just the baseline for the business to be there. The variable costs then are scaled up based on how many hamburgers am I producing, what am I putting in them, et cetera. So let's say, you know, for to have a, a shop to sell hamburgers, well, you need your employees. So you're paying their, you're paying their salaries. Uh, you need a building, so you got to pay rent, and you need the equipment to make the hamburgers. All of that set in stone. You will be paying those costs no matter how many hamburgers you're selling. So those are your fixed costs. Let's say it's $1,000 uh, per month. Well, you will be paying $1,000 per month no matter what. And then on top of that is your scale, right? So how many how many hamburgers am I selling? Now, let me ask you guys something. If I'm already paying $1,000, and your cost for these hamburgers, fix, you know, fixed cost just to have the hamburger shop, just to have your employees working there. Is it better for me if I produce one hamburger and sell it to one person, or if I produce 10,000 hamburgers and sell them to 10,000 people? Because here's the thing, the variable costs don't go up. The variable cost for each hamburger is the same. Obviously the, the variable cost, you know, it, they increase linearly with the amount of hamburgers they're making, they're increasing but they're staying the same per hamburger. So you would think, you know, if this was just total variable cost divided by unit cost, it wouldn't matter how many hamburgers I sell. If it cost me $5 per hamburger, then my expenses are just gonna go up as I make them. But here's the thing, the unit, the, the fixed costs are already there. So if I only sell one hamburger, 
when all of a sudden I have these thousand dollars that I've uh, that I've spent fixed cost, these five dollars to create the hamburger. So that's one thousand five dollars with one hamburger. So I pay, I just paid a thousand five per hamburger. But if I make two hamburgers, all of a sudden that's you know that's ten bucks the variable cost in those hamburgers. A thousand in fixed. All of a sudden that's a thousand ten divided by two. So now it's five hundred and five per hamburger. You can see, I mean, the hamburger now costs half the same amount because I made two hamburgers instead of one hamburger and I sold that money or I, and I sold those products. So you can see the unit costs go down and down. I mean, this keeps going exponentially. Obviously, once you get to, you know, the difference between selling 10,000 hamburgers and 10,001 hamburgers is not that that large. But basically what you're doing this again, this is this is a bit of a complicated explanation, but you're spreading out your costs over more items. That's what this allows you to do. When you're creating a large volume, you can spread this out over a large, your fixed cost. So, I mean, cause we're talking realistically in a business, fixed costs are like a hundred thousand. Well, it, you know, if you're spreading that over, you know, a volume of a thousand units sold uh, or, you know, 50,000 units sold, that's a huge difference in what you're paying. But, you know, those fixed costs of a hundred thousand, spreading them between a thousand units or 50,000, I mean that 50,000 makes it way cheaper and way more manageable because the fixed costs go down and down and down and down, which is the overall cost that you're paying. Um, so again, because the variable costs usually are, are pretty minuscule in comparison to what the fixed costs are. Um, really your goal, I mean, this is where kind of breaking even comes in as well. The goal is you gotta just cover what the fixed costs are. The, the unit, the, the variable cost, the cost to make each individual hamburger, once you've already put a thousand in for the shop, as I was saying in the previous example, once you've already put the thousand in, $5 to make one hamburger is pretty minuscule. So you want to sell as many as possible to start optimizing that money that you're spending. All right. So that's a very long explanation, but I hope it is all understandable. If, if you have any questions, go and ask them in the comments and you guys can do your own research as well. So there are many different types of economies of scale. All right. And these are, these are important things. There are two types. And again, these are the two famous types in, in business management, internal, external. All right. Internal economies of scale. Internal means it is something that is within the business, as the name would indicate. It's something the business is doing. External, we'll get to that in a sec, but external is outside of the business. It's usually impacting the entire industry, not just one business, all right? But we'll, we'll describe that in a bit. All right, so what are the internal economies of scale, right? So internal, let, let's just remind ourselves, again, what is the basic definition of economies of scale? Basic definition, I increase my production and I save money. I in, by increasing my production, I can make all of my costs cheaper because I'm spreading them out over a large volume. And also when I produce more, it makes certain things cheaper. And that's actually the first economy of scale. First internal is purchasing economies of scale. Uh, also known as bulk buying, right? Think about, okay, if you go to Costco, right? Think about how, you know, you get this massive jumbo pack of hot dogs and it's way cheaper than if you just go to the store, like per hot dog, it's way cheaper than if you just go to the store and get one hot dog. Right, because they make it cheaper for you to buy this big, you know, twenty-four pack than to buy one. Um, so that's just that's a great example of like if you if you have a large company, a, you're, 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 you have a large amount of production and a large number of sales, it is far cheaper for you to get the volume for that because you can you can make these massive bulk orders and suppliers will often give you a discount because you are giving them such a big order. Um, Second one is technological. This is, this is pretty simple. You innovate technologically and this allows for you to save money on technology costs. For instance, if you have, you know, a printer in your office instead of a typewriter, you're saving a lot of money on, you know, creating copy and things like that. It's kind of an old fashioned example, but I think you guys get what I'm saying. Uh, financial. With financial, uh, this, is, this is a bit of a complicated, a complicated one, but basically it's saying with, with economies of scale, it means you're becoming a big business. You're not just a small business, you're a big business. That means it is easier for you to get loans because if you're, it's one thing if you're a mom and pop shop and you go to JP Morgan and say, Hey, I like a loan versus if you are Google and say, Hey, I'd like a loan. Like just the, the difference there, right? Of, you know, if a big company comes in, it's easier to get a loan. You can usually get better rates on them and things like that because you have this large company. Also just financially, you're getting more production. You're making more money. The la the, uh, the fourth one is marketing. Um, with marketing, it is easier for me to, to, uh, advertise a large range of products. You know, if I'm Apple, it's easier for me to advertise the iPhone, the iPad, the Mac, the AirPods together than it is for me to advertise a single product. Because the problem is if my entire identity is that one single product, it's hard to attract customers. 
And again, marketing costs a lot. It doesn't cost me that much more to market four products than to market one product because I just put four things in, in the commercial or put four things on the billboard or whatever the case may be. But I'm making a lot more money because now instead of, let's say you're not interested in Bluetooth headphones, well then a Apple advertising just AirPods wouldn't be interesting to you. But now if that same billboard was gonna cost the same money, has an iPhone and a Mac on it, and you're like, oh, you know, you know what, actually you wanna get a computer. Well, then that ad did entice you. It cost the same money, it enticed you. So again, it's cheaper to market a bunch of products together than it is to market a single product uh, on its own. And then the final one is managerial. So again, if you're a bigger business, you have larger diversification, it's easier to get specialized employees and improve your efficiency. Think about, you know, again, if you have these different departments and you're a large business with a lot of money, it's easier for me, for me to be like, all right, you know what? I'm going to get someone who's specialized in this specific uh, area. Then if it's a smaller business with less production, it's harder to do that. It's harder for me to get someone specialized in a certain area because they're, you know, I probably don't have the money to pay them. Because um, again, if you're a small business, everything's got to be limited. All right. And that moves to external economy of scales. I think a fantastic example of this was, was when I read an article re just recently was that, you know, think of California, right? And what happened to California? Well, that, all, you know, a lot of people have thought, you know, hey, California is a great place to have uh, a film company. You know why? Because there's good weather all year round, nice people, it's a safe area, you know, tax laws and everything, or maybe tax laws, maybe not. I, if it's California, probably not. But you, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's a nice place. You film all year round. They got nice American looking towns, right? For a lot of those kind of American type movies. And so that's, that's a great location. So one film company goes and sets up there. And then another film company gets up and they're like, you know what? We're going to go to California too. You know why? Because now that that first film company's there, there's more directors, there's more script writers, there's more locations that are, you know, set up for it. The, just the, the places and the people are now set up in a situation where it's easier for me to come in there and set up my phone company. So when a second phone company comes, and a third one comes, and a fourth one comes. Blah, blah, blah. This is a great example of an external economy of scale. Basically that there's an increase in some part of the, some part of the business sector. And this applies again to a, to a whole industry, not to one business, to a whole industry that creates economies of scale in the whole industry by increasing its size, increasing its resources, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is also why, again, like with the California example, we see a lot of finance companies in New York. Why? Because New York already has a large volume of, uh, of finance companies. So it's a lot easier for you to enter in there when there's already a network of people, there's already a way for you to connect and things like that. There's already a lot of customers. It's seen as like this business center. It's way easier for me to set one up there than for me to, you know, get up and go to Boise, Idaho, yeah. Boise, Idaho. Boise, Idaho, uh, and set up my, my finance business there where there's a very small market and there's not a lot of things. And basically, because if I go to somewhere where there isn't a large number uh, of people, I'm going to have to set up all of my own routes. And, you know, that's like the previous example. That's like you, you know, paying all this money to make this, this, this hamburger company to get your, you know, your, your store and your employees and selling one hamburger. Versus if you go to New York, it's as if you're selling a thousand hamburgers because you have way more access and things are a lot cheaper for you to get in there. Um, there's a lot of things that create external economies of scale. Uh, improved infrastructure is a good one. Uh, advances in industrial efficiency. So let's say machinery, technological developments, uh, employee training, and the growth of other industries that support your organization. Um, basically, this allows you to reduce your variable costs, to reduce everything, because again, the whole industry is just working better. There's just more tools and things available for you. Basically, the industry is growing, so therefore it's easier for you as your business to operate within it because now there's more resources, more people, more presence. Um, so that's just that's just a basic example of like there's just external things that are increasing really the whole industry. So like, I don't know, let's say, you know, all of a sudden there's this new, like uh, I think a great example would be, you know, let's take your, your hamburger shop. We're gonna retire. I think this might be a recurring example. I didn't plan on it being a recurring example, but it's a very good one uh, for, for a lot of these is let's say you got your, your, your potato, no. Nah, your, your hamburger company, sorry. And then all of a sudden there's this new discovery of just a huge, huge amount of potatoes, just somewhere. So now all of a sudden you're selling French fries and they cost this amount. But now for everyone who sells French fries, they're now way cheaper because potatoes are now way more available. Uh, that, that affects the whole industry. It's not just your company that now has this new amount of potatoes. Everyone has more potatoes. 
Um, and as a result, it makes it cheaper for everybody. This is just kind of a new kind of influx of, of resources or the new fryers were made that, you know, make it way quicker for you to, to, to fry your fries. Well, then all of a sudden that's, a, that's impacting the whole industry and it's making it so you can produce way more uh, fries, produce them a lot quicker and produce them a lot cheaper. And that affects the whole industry. Um, all right. And then that also brings to the other side of things. So economies of scale are not this like infinite sum of, you can't just grow infinitely. You know, I mean, businesses are a bubble and at some point they explode if they get too big. Um, not just from government regulation, but also because you have diseconomies of scale, which is the reverse, as you could imagine. Uh, it's when a company or industry gets too big and their costs begin to increase instead of decrease. Now, there are a variety of causes. One would be a communication problem. Obviously, if you have this massive, you know, multinational company with a headquarters in China and a headquarters in the U.S., it's hard to effectively coordinate at some point because you just have so many differences and so much distance, so many people in the middle. Um, you can have overworking because, again, if you just have such a large process, you just need a lot of people working all the time to keep this whole thing because it's like this delicate web of, of organization. Um, also, you can alienate workers because it's hard for you to feel connected to this, you know, massive mega corporation. Um, and also you can have slow decision making for the same reasons. If, you know, someone makes a, a rule in Seattle where your headquarters are, I mean, I think Starbucks, uh, I, I don't know why Starbucks just came into my head, but you know, Seattle say they make a decision. It's hard for that to get applied everywhere quickly and effectively. Cause there's so many Starbucks franchises around the country. It's just hard for that to work. So that's that's where diseconomies of scale can come into place. Is you just deal with different communication issues. Um, also, you have diminishing marginal returns. Uh, this is basically to say that when you have, um, you know, we were talking about your scales of, of opportunity, scales of of um, uh, business. Basically, so if you have, you know, a certain certain product that you're creating. You can create diminishing marginal returns if you increase one of your factors of production, but not all of them. That's to say, if you, you know, whatever, you're creating a car and if you just start pumping in like all these, you know, cheap tires, but none of the other parts are being improved with it, you create diminishing marginal returns because you, you got economies of scale on these tires, right? Fantastic. But you don't have anything else. The car is still equally as expensive to make. You're just spending more on the, you know, uh, you're just spending more on the tires. Because now you just have this like influx of tires. I don't know if that's the best example, but you know, that's a diminishing marginal return. It's basically you're you're not you have to improve the whole production process. I mean, this goes back to our scale of of opportunities. Of you know, if you want to uh, reach economies of scale with scale of opportunities, if you want to scale up a business, you have to do everything. It can't just be like one thing. It has to be all the parts of the production process. All right, we're now 18 minutes in and we're about halfway through the chapter. So I'm going to try to go quicker, um, but economies of scale are really, really, really important in business management. So it is an important thing uh, to explain and understand correctly. Um, the next part is small versus large organizations. This is a more straightforward one. <clears throat> um, basically, this talks about the advantages and disadvantages of small and large organizations. Small organizations, if we're going to summarize this, uh, the advantages, the more personal. I mean, think about your, your average mom and pop shop, right? It's more personal. It's more easily changeable. One person makes the decision and all of a sudden it can just change. It can change whatever you need to change. It's very adaptable. Or if there's a problem in the local area, easily you can nap to it. Uh, however, problems is hard to employ, especially because it's a mom and pop shop. You know, the employees for magic mom and pop. All right. But you can't really get, you know, anyone. You can't get an expert on any products because you don't have the money or the capability. You don't have economies of scale, really, because it's a, a small operation. You have less access to finance. It's harder to get someone to come and invest in a mom and pop shop than it is in a mega corporation. And you can't really research and you can't really diversify because you're just limited. You've put yourself in this niche of and, you know, you serve well. You have a good relationship with your customers. You have good relationships with the employees because it's a small operation. But you have limited power versus large organization, which is like the complete opposite um, and really, you like you read through the chapter and it reads is just like whatever the small business is good at, the bad, the large business is bad and vice versa. Um, basically, large organizations, you get economies of scale, you can hire specialists, you can get finance more easily, you can diversify more easily, and you can research more easily. All those things because you just have a lot more resources. However, on the other hand, it's also less manageable because let's say, and especially if we're talking, you know, you have different branches. You have one in, you know, whatever, New York, you have one in Los Angeles. Well, say something happens in Los Angeles. It's hard for you to make a decision 
because it's this massive corporation. You got a large level and may, you know, if your headquarters is in New York, it's going to take a while for it to get there and make the decision and, and, and adapt to it and whatever you got to deal with so much, you know, bureau, uh, bureaucracy. So it is a difficult uh, process. Uh, it's also impersonal. I mean, it's hard for you to feel a personal connection to Dunkin' Donuts versus like your local coffee shop. Um, and then weaker relationships, especially, you know, between employees or employers and workers. Um, because again, it's, it's more of a mega corporation. You don't feel very much love for a mega corporation, if we're being honest. Um, all right. So moving on to the next part of the chapter, we have internal versus external growth. So internal versus external growth. What are these? Um, basically, the, the different forms of, as the name indicates, growing the business. However, internal uh, comes within the business, you know, things the business does to expand itself. External is known as inorganic. And we'll get to that. Um, <clears throat> all right. So internal, organic. As it's also called. Um, this means you're expanding with your own resources within the company. This can be done in a variety of ways. Pricing strategies such as offering your products at a cheaper price or different, you know, whatever, getting in price wars, uh, marketing, better marketing, expanding, either moving in new regions or new products, increasing the amount of capital you invest into the company, innovating with new technology uh, or training your staff, you know, changing the training techniques so that you're more efficient and more effective, things like that. Sorry, I'm, I'm going quickly with this, but they are pretty straightforward. I think it's all common sense. You just got to, you know, have it internalized. There's different ways you can, you know, within the company, increasing your investment, changing your training techniques, changing your pricing, changing your marketing, trying to reach more customers or also make things more efficient from within. And that increases your market share and increases your reach to other parts uh, of the market, other customers, things like that. Now, external, this is also known as inorganic. So you're going outside of the organization. Uh, now, there are two kinds of, of this, as they're known. There's vertical integration and horizontal integration. Uh, vertical integration has two further subcategories. So this is we're getting into like the, you know, we're making like a tree here with all the different categories. It's getting pretty long. Um, basically, so vertical integration is if you imagine the supply chain, right? You could almost imagine it like this. And, you know, we've discussed this in previous chapters. The bottom part here, this is, you know, the, the primary sector. This is your raw materials. Then you got the secondary sector, your manufacturing, tertiary sector, your retail, quaternary sector, your, your information research, things like that. So if you're starting down here, let's say you're your retailer. All right, you're up here. Well, great. Um, so you have this part and this is a chain, right? This is a chain that's going up and it's going down. That's why it's called vertical. Uh, so if you're doing vertical uh, integration, vertical growth, what you're saying is you're trying to expand the area you control on the supply chain. So let's say you're tertiary and you're like, you know what? I also want to control manufacturing. Well, then you acquire a manufacturing business or you, you acquire your, your supplier. So now you control both parts of the supply chain. And that works fantastically. Or even you say, you know what? I want to I want, to, I want to be able to control who I get my resources from, natural resources, control the manufacturing and control the retail part. So these, this is vertical expansion. Or let's say you're a manufacturer and you're like, you know what, I, I'm tired of having to go through these middlemen, you know, I'm tired of going through these retailers. I want to sell directly to my consumer and keep all my profits and stop paying money to, you know, deal with all this other stuff. So then you take over the retailer and now you're selling directly to the consumer, um, I guess. The, the manufacturers don't really pay to the retailers. It's more like the retailers take the manufacturers' profits because actually the retailers pay the manufacturers because they're suppliers. Sorry, <laughs> unnecessary nuance. Um, anyway, there's two there's two versions of vertical integration, as I said, forward and backward, pretty straightforward. Forward means uh, you're going from you're going from where you are up. So if you're you know whatever you're a manufacturer, you're getting a retailer. Versus backward is if you're a retailer, you're getting a manufacturer. That's simple. You know, you're going either up forward is going up the chain, uh, backward is going down the chain. All right. Horizontal integration. That is when you pair with other businesses. Um, you know, you're mixing with other businesses either in the same sector or, or different sectors. Uh, a, an example of this would be, for example, you know, it, it's because they don't necessarily have to be. Um, Competing businesses. An example is Ford acquiring Jaguar because Ford is for low to mid class, Jaguar is high class, but they're both cars. So they kind of merged together. They weren't direct competitors, but they merged together. So now they're working together to make money. They're getting the economies of scale, et cetera, et cetera. 
And Ford is going to a different market than Jaguar. So their joint business, and now they have this really wide range. It's as if, you know, Ford had created a high-class car or Jaguar had created a low to mid-class car. Um, but now they've combined and they can cater to a larger market. Um, so that's just one example. But that's horizontal integration is you're, you're mixing with another business. Sometimes you're a competitor, but you don't necessarily have to be. Um, all right. So now what are the methods of external growth? Because there are quite a few of them. I'm just going to go quickly. Um, conglomerate, mergers, takeovers, or acquisitions. Uh, this is basically, so you take another business, you guys mush together, and both of them cease to exist, and instead they become one joint business. Um, so this would be, I don't know, if McDonald like tomorrow McDonald's and Wendy's got up, they joined together and created some completely new business um, that was neither of them. That they're just there's now a new business. They combine their operations. Their new business. It's got many advantages uh, as you create a new company. You know you you have lots of opportunities for marketing. You can expand new markets. Uh, however, also there's a chance you don't you know work well together. Um, you know if the corporate cultures are too different, things like that. The idea is you're basically trying to smoosh into one company. Um, so that's kind of what the mergers. And again, this is where, you know, takeovers is also that. It's like McDonald's like eats. It would be like if McDonald's just bought out Wendy's, that's another version of doing it. But, you know, th then Wendy's just kind of disappears into McDonald's. Um, or, you know, vice versa or acquisitions, which is, you know, a similar thing. Um, joint ventures. This is very similar uh, to conglomerates, uh, to conglomerate mergers. Um, but the difference is really just you're kind of keeping your identity. Um, in this case, one example I was given uh, was Sony and Ericsson joined together and they created Sony Ericsson. But you're joining together and you're creating a new legal identity. Um, but it's not as if you're, you know, dissolving the businesses in the same way. They're still kind of existing. Those identities are still there. They're just together now and they're under this joint kind of, um, this joint partnership. All right, so it's, it's more of a joining versus conglomerations a dissolution in a, in a mixing. Uh, think of, I don't know, it's kind of hard to like, I was trying to use an analogy of like, think of like when you put the powder in the, the milk to make hot chocolate, that's like a, a conglomerate versus, you know, a, a joint ventures, you're kind of putting the water and oil in there. Like the, they're in the drink together now, but they're still, you still got some, you know, still got them separate. Uh, although maybe that's not the best because like, it's like, the, it's not like they're repelling each other, you know, they're still like they're together. Um, and now the third one, strategic alliances. So this is the, this has a bigger distinction. It's also similar to a joint venture because the two businesses come together. They're coming together. They're remaining their own identities or maintaining those own identities. However, they also don't make a, a singular legal entity. They remain separate legal entities. It's just an alliance. It's, a, it's as if McDonald's and Wendy said, all right, we're working together. We're friends, but they didn't, they don't dissolve each other. They don't even make, you know, a McDonald's Wendy's Incorporated. They're they're both McDonald's Incorporated, Wendy's Incorporated, but they're just working together. That's it. It's just an alliance. Uh, final one's franchising. Think of this as what McDonald's does, um, which is basically you have, you know, your overall business, which is McDonald's. But the thing is McDonald's itself doesn't own really most of the McDonald's like I walk into or you walk into to go get our, our, our Big Macs. Who actually owns it is a different person, an entrepreneur who has gotten the franchise of McDonald's. This means that you have, you know, McDonald's basically gives you the rights to use their store. Say, all right, here's the product, here's the regulations, and then you take it over and you sell it. Now, this has some advantages for you as as uh, the franchisee, the person who is creating the franchise or isn't like buying the franchise rights and creating the store. Because, for instance, if I were to just create my own burger restaurant. It's a little bit hard for me to get people on board, right? I got to, you know, do a lot of marketing and build myself up and deal with all the different, you know, legal, whatever, versus my franchisee. I already have McDonald's existing brand. I just grab that, make my McDonald's store. Of course, I'm under the McDonald's corporation, but it also makes me getting customers way easier because a lot more people will be convinced if it's just a McDonald's shows up, then, you know, just like a, a new burger joint without any kind of existing brand around it. You know what I'm saying? Um, so that has that advantage. But the disadvantage is obviously I'm also paying money to the franchise. Yeah, I'm not pocketing all the money myself. Um, and I have less control because I do have to follow the regulations of the franchisor, which is the one who sells you the franchise. Now for the franchisor, 
their job is they take care of the marketing. They're the ones who create, you know, the national brand and all the national policies, et cetera, et cetera, the international brand. Um, so all that, like the big stuff, they take care of that. And they're getting the money from the franchisees. However, they're dependent on the franchisees running things correctly, having success because they're not running directly the stores. So they are letting a bit of control go by doing that. And also, you know, there's a chance that the franchisees don't run their, their joints correctly. There's, you know, there's a bunch of different possible, uh, probably, you know, it's not easy to revoke it. You could have a conflict in profit and volume. Many things can come up. So, yeah, I mean, you could deal with, you could deal with a variety of problems being a franchise or also in many cases you provide the training. Uh, although it's not always the case, I've worked for a few franchises and in many cases it was the franchise itself that gave me the training, not the, not the overall corporation. Um, but it, it does really depend. Um, and yeah, so again, has its benefits, has its disadvantages, um, just in terms of, you know, you can have disagreements, but also it can, it can work out really well. Um, there's a reason it's such a common method. All right. So we're now at the half hour mark. We're getting close to the end here. Uh, again, I told you guys, this is a fat topic, but we're getting there. Uh, all right. Final. There's only two points left. First one is globalization. So this is just the expanding of a business globally. Uh, this can be done for a variety of reasons. Uh, technology, technological developments enables you to go to new countries. Uh, trade being opened, liberalized, be regulated. So it's easier for me to expand to other countries. Uh, multicultural awareness. Think of this as like in the U.S., there's this thing that's very common. It's called Japan fever. It's basically when Americans get like obsessed with Japanese culture and like sushi and Japanese video games or whatever. And so that creates this massive opportunity for Japanese companies to come to the U.S. and sell the products because there's now an existing market. People are like, oh, I want this foreign product. I want to buy this foreign product. I mean, the same thing happens of, you know, I'm, I'm living in Europe right now and it's all over the place. You see foreign products, you know, German products and Spanish products and, and French products sold in countries that are not their native countries because people want, you know, the authentic whatever. Um, so that's a big thing is cultural awareness and the desire to have other cultures products. Um, also language. That could open doors, especially as the world's starting to speak more English. Uh, English has become the national language of business. So now it's a lot easier for me to expand to other countries than it would have been in the past. Um, but anyway, globalization is you open up your business, go to other countries, has the advantages of you can expand to new markets, you can sell your products in new places, but also it has a high cost to expand. In, and especially if it's a country that doesn't already recognize your brand, even if they might want your product, if they don't recognize your brand, it's hard. But if they do, like in the case of Americans who, you know, we're all we're always looking for Nintendo, well, then it was pretty easy to sell Nintendo in the U.S. Uh, now, going on to the final point of this chapter, thank goodness we have got here, multinational corporations. This goes with the same point of globalization. This is any corporation that uh, that works in more than two countries. This can have a variety of impacts uh, within the countries that are expanded into. Uh, it can be economic. For instance, these new companies create more jobs. Uh, they give customers more options because now they have a new business that they can buy from. They don't just have to buy from the local national. Um, it can threaten local industries. If you, you know, if you have a local, you know, whatever, local chicken chain and then KFC shows up, well, that can really ruin your business. Uh, it creates more technology, especially if it's a less developed country economically and you have a Western company, you know, or a, a country from, so our company from a more developed country showing up, that can be beneficial. Also a balance of trade, as in, you know, these countries can now balance their exports and their imports because now they have more imports coming in. Um, employment, again, it creates jobs, but it can also displace workers because again, if you, going back to the KFC example, if KFC shows up in your country and you were working at the local chicken chain and then the chicken chain shuts down, well, then you're out of a job. So that can displace local workers as well. They can have sociological impacts, impacting how people think, their attitudes about things, environmental impacts. It can impact climate change, create more pollution. Or if the, kind of, if the company is socially responsible, it could actually set an example uh, for local companies to be more environmentally responsible. But usually it's a negative impact um, because if it's an expansion, if it's you know, a U.S. company expanding into uh, you know less economically developed uh, country, Normally, they don't tend to be very corporately responsible. They tend to more just take advantage of deregulation. Um, and then the final one is political. A, a new company coming in from outside can demand uh, stabler economic policies. Um, 
they can put pressure because especially if it's an American company coming into a, you know, a less economically developed country or, you know, just a, a European company as well, they can demand better policies so that they can keep functioning there. And usually the government will respond because they want the profit from the taxes that that will bring in. Um, also, there can be public private uh, sector partnerships because the governments of those countries can partner up with the new expanding businesses there. And that can create all kinds of new economic opportunities. And that is it, guys. Uh, if, any, if any of you guys have stuck around this long, thank you for listening to my rambling. Um, I hope this has been helpful. Again, this is a very long chapter, but a lot of great content, a lot of very useful stuff, and a lot of important stuff. Economies of scale show up everywhere. Globalization of multinational companies are important things to understand as our scales of opportunities. And of course, the differences between small and large businesses um, are important as well. So hope it has all served you guys. Thank you for watching and have a great rest of your day.